I'm so excited to have um, Dr. Kane here. So one of the things that the Teaching Academy is working on right now is um, developing that affiliate status I mentioned, along with a clinical affiliate. And so we're trying to do more programming that involves the health sciences, um, from nursing to social work to PT, OT, medicine, pharmacy, and I probably missed somebody there. Um, so Dr. King was uh, kind enough to um, represent nursing and how empathy and humility is taught in that. So let me just take a few moments to introduce her. She's very humble, so this is like a piece of, of her world. Um, Dr. King is an assistant professor in the UW Madison School of Nursing. She is an advanced practice clinician and geriatrics researcher and educator. <laughs> she has taught in both the undergraduate and graduate nursing programs. Dr. King is a blended learning fellow and a recent <laughs> graduate of the Madison Teaching and Learning Excellence Fellowship Program. She is also a 2017 inductee in the UW Madison Teaching Academy. Her favorite approach to teaching is using blended and active learning strategies to stimulate critical thinking in her undergraduate and graduate students. So help me welcome Dr. King. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay, now if I was if I was channeling Chris Castro up here, I would have a timer going. <laughs> that would buzz at you. So let's do a report out. What did you come up with? What is empathy to people? Shout it out. Don't be shy. Anyone? Okay. Sympathy with what? Sympathy that blooms. Uh, empathy is when you can feel somebody else's emotion. Feeling somebody else's emotion. You know, the pains or suffering or the feeling, if you can feel it, because there is discussion, should we hear them? Mm -hmm. He's hearing people, but if you are hearing and you are not feeling it, you're just getting it from here and goes to another mm -hmm. way. So is that that connecting, that connecting. understanding piece? Understanding it, feeling it. Yeah. Other thoughts? What is this for you? Empathy is being aware that people have different sets of values. So it's being aware that people have different sets of values and that your values are not necessarily the same as everybody else's. Yeah, that that's an important starting point. Yeah, yeah. It's not a cookie cutter. We're not all the same. So we talked about empathy as imagining another person's experience and resonating with the emotions that they're feeling because of that. So it's not about becoming that other person but about understanding where they're coming from and feeling a little bit what they feel, but not too much. <laughs> not too much. Get it theorier, to get to absorb. Be a face, okay. Yeah, one of the things that our table was talking about, um, I personally feel that sympathy is, is important to distinguish the two, and I think sympathy is feeling sorry for someone, um, whereas empathy is, like the gentleman said, is understanding and feeling where they're coming from, but I also think that empathy um, allows you more of the ability to act upon something, to you know, know that you can do something about it. So that action generation can come up. So I can probably skip my next five slides. <laughs> Nail it. So I'll tell you what we see in the literature. Um, as you've talked about, we have lots of different definitions for what this is. And it can be really confusing when we all say, well, be empathetic. And my definition of empathy is different than your definition of empathy. We're going to have a disconnect. So in general, with the literature support, what empathy seems to do is enable us to react to each other in a way that promotes cooperation and unity, rather than in a way that promotes conflict and isolation. So it's that understanding that to coming together on a perspective. So what is consistent across the literature are two components, so both a cognitive component and an affective component. And we can tap both of those components in our courses and with our students. So that cognitive mechanism is that it helps us imagine that internal state of somebody else. What I can stand in your shoes. I can understand what you're going through. I can interpret this. I can formulate a plan based upon that. And that affective piece is that physiologic, emotional, gut wrenching response we get to that emotion. We all been in that situation where you're hit with a trigger, and all of a sudden your heart rate picks up. You feel really nauseated. You're just, you just, you just want to cry. And you're reacting to that emotional state that you are seeing is the affective component that we're triggering. We actually can do that to our core students. So in nursing, what do we see? Our definition in my discipline is that ability to recognize to some extent and share in those emotions and those states of mind that are patients that we take care of, but able to understand the meaning and the significance of that person's behavior based on that experience that they're having. So it's that capacity to understand. And yet keep that barrier. 
I understand, but I also have my own identity. So I'm not getting too drawn into this emotional response or I can't be there and do it. So you'll see that in my discipline. So there's been lots of nursing theorists that have looked at this issue of empathy, and there's consistent three components. We'll see this across multiple disciplines. So it's that aspect of that sensitive nature that we're looking for. There's that cognitive, in nursing, it's observation. I'm watching what you're doing, I'm taking in what you're doing, I'm understanding what you're doing, I'm interpreting what you're doing. So mental processing. And now nursing talks about communicative. So how do I verbally respond to you? And we talked about it in terms of having therapeutic communication. So that, that this is helpful instead of me just telling you what to do, but being that guide and helping you in your decision about what to do next in your illness management. So empathy in nursing has really been identified as one of the most critical um, ingredients in a healthy relationship that we form with our patients. And we have identified in the literature that nurses who are highly empathetic are really better at giving total care. And what we mean by that in nursing is that we take that perspective of the other. We take into consideration that we're all different. We have different backgrounds. We have different cultural exposures. We have um, different reactions to illness. So not everybody's going to react the same to getting a diagnosis of cancer. And everybody's going to react the same to getting a diagnosis of congestive heart failure. And every parent is going to love that newborn when it's first born, especially if you're sleep deprived and you know you got kids better in the background that just want mommy to come home. So there's a difference in our most experiences, and we think about nurses who are highly empathetic do better at taking that total perspective of that individual. So we're thinking, well, we're teaching our students this, right? We, this is what we do in our nursing program. But in reality, when we looked at the literature and are nurses empathetic, not so much. So nurses actually score pretty low on empathy. And our nursing students, unfortunately, so score pretty low on empathy. So I think we have to take a step back and go, oh, hmm, what are we doing? And how do we improve our programs so that we promote empathy? Now, the good news is that when you expose nurses to empathetic interventions, their empathy scores increase. But the question is, is can they be sustained? So the data is only looked at the bump, but we don't know how long that actually holds in. So in nursing, we think about developing empathy. It's a skill. And um, Dr. Kramer talked about it. We can absolutely teach our students how to be empathetic. And I would agree with him that now more than ever, we need to be thinking about how we teach our students to be empathetic. And in nursing, we think about it in three ways. You have to be able to listen, to hear what that person is telling you. You have to be fully attentive. Put down your phone. I don't know how many times I've practiced. Put down your phone. Sometimes I want like you to close your laptop. Um, <laughs> engage with me. You know, be fully present. And then be able to suspend judgment. My life isn't the same as your life. We all have different experiences. So the area of social work, um, another area where you see a lot of literature on empathy, um, and this one is a little different now. They're defining empathy again. It's that same flavor that we've been hearing about, perceiving, understanding, experiencing these emotional states of another individual. Social work takes this a little different. They talk about that automatic and that unconscious affective response, that emotional response, that gut-wrenching, oh my gosh situation that we, they are faced with with their client. That they have, they get that immediate response to. They also think about that perspective taking, that cognition, of uh, being able to say, I'm going to make this conscious decision and give you, and it's the action component that we see in social work. The ability to regulate one's ownness or oneself, and that self awareness is also that important component which we spoke to, is that I understand your experience, but I can also have my own identity here so that we can jointly work together on decisions. Medicine, another little um, change in what they think about empathy. empathy. Um, this is really built about more about being able to communicate understanding to a patient. And you'll see that a lot in their literature. They talk about this cognitive attribute also, this ability to understand that patient's inner experience, but also being able to communicate that understanding to that individual. Now, it's interesting in medicine, this is the only place where you see the term clinical empathy where it talks about the patient-doctor relationship. And again, that affective and that cognitive component comes out in their literature. 
So that affect, it may see it more as that passive emotional response. Social work sees it as more of this unconscious, uncontrolled type of response. Nurses who are seeing sensitive. So you see that more in our early types of literature. In cognitive, this is they really only describe this as the development of an active skill. That we can nurture this and we can develop this in our positions and training. Now, I think it's interesting in medicine, this is in a different than I see in any place else, it's really related to diagnostic accuracy, therapeutic adherence, patient satisfaction while remaining time efficient. So how do they use it within their workflow? Is how empathy is described within their discipline. Interestingly enough, also in the studies in medicine, like in the studies of nursing, is that medical students and medical residents need to score well on empathy during their training and during their practice. So we talked about empathy and sympathy, and I think we hit it. There's, there's a difference. But does anybody know the work of Brené Brown? Okay. Have you seen her um, YouTube? Awesome. So I'm going to do uh, this little YouTube clip because it's for hers. So what is empathy, and why is it very different than sympathy? Empathy fuels connection. Sympathy drives to connection. Empathy, it's, a, it's very interesting. Teresa Wiseman is a nursing scholar who studies professions, very diverse professions, where empathy is relevant, and came up with four qualities of empathy. Perspective taking, the ability to take the perspective of another person, or, or recognize their perspective as their truth. Staying out of judgment, not easy when you enjoy the mental sense of experience. Recognizing emotion in other people and then communicating that. Empathy is being with people. And to me, I always think of empathy as this kind of sacred space when someone's kind of in a deep hole and they shout out from the bottom and they say, I'm stuck, it's dark, I'm overwhelmed. And then we look and we say, hey, I'm down here. I know what it's like down here, and you're not alone. Sympathy is, ooh, it's bad, uh huh. Uh, no, you want a sandwich? Uh, empathy is a choice, and it's a vulnerable choice because in order to connect with you, I have to connect with something in myself that knows that feeling. Rarely, if ever, is an empathic response begin with athletes. I had a, yeah. And we do it all the time. Because you know what? Someone just shared something with us. It's incredibly painful. And we're trying to silver lining it. I don't think that's a verb. But I'm using it as one. We're trying to put the silver lining around it. So I had a miscarriage. At least you know you can get pregnant. I think my marriage is falling apart. At least you have a marriage. <laughs> <laughs> John's getting kicked out of school <coughs> for the next week. But one of the things we do sometimes in the face of very difficult conversations is we try to make things better. If I share something with you that's very difficult, I would maybe say, I don't even know what to say right now, but thank God you told me. Because the truth is, rarely can a response make something better. What makes something better is connection. So I think this really speaks to, you know, the uh, whole issue of the connection piece. That there we go. I didn't think I was going to do this, but there we go. All right. So the connection piece, and there was a really interesting study that was done by Conrad, and they went in, they wanted to say, what's going on with our college students? And at their levels of empathy, and have those changed over time, because our society has certainly changed over time. So they looked at these empathy scores across a wide um, period of time, 1979 to 2009. Look at that, and over 13,000 
participants that they were able to grab data on. And they did a meta-analytic method, and they were looking at these samples of college students that compared questionnaires over these time periods, and they did mean scores, and they weighted it for sample size, and they started to see what this was like. There were two primary measures that they were looking at, and one was empathetic concern, whereas that this, this particular um, subdomain measures an individual's are you other oriented to that individual's feelings? And then that's that affective component. And then the other one is that perspective taking, which is the cognitive component. Can you imagine what that other person's point of view is? Can you get inside the skin of the other person or stand in their shoes, which has been described that way? So what they actually found was that kindness over time in both of these concerns. So if you look at what happened in 1979 to 89, you look at these decades, we're down here in 2005, 2009, we're starting to see these dots in what's happening in these empathy scores within American college students in both of these important domains. So that really, I think, for us as an emphasis, we need to think about how do we teach this to a generation of learners that are now at our college system. And it's, is it something that we should think about how do we actively incorporate these into our curriculum? So I think it's important because having empathy is an important factor, motivation, and the ability to inhibit harmful behavior. So if I can imagine the potential harm I'm going to cause to you, I'm most likely not going to do it. So it's been linked to this antisocial type of behavior that we've seen more prevalent in our society. And there's been a lot of research that's been done that's shown what is this correlation between low empathy and violent behavior, and it's pretty strong. Empathy, high violent behavior. There's also been more work that's looking at these scores of slow um, empathetic concern or perspective taking, and it's highly linked to antisocial types of behavior. So if you look back at this data, what's happening with our college students has gone more on empathetic concern and perspective. So, um, the authors of this, Conrad and all, they did a really nice discussion on what's the hypothesis of this? How is this linking what's happening within our societies itself and our college students that we now see coming into our university? And they talked about this rise in narcissistic type of behaviors that we're seeing in college students. It's me. So, what me, me, me. And, and I can post everything about me out on social media. And look, everybody knows all about me. So, there's this shift. What we're seeing. And there's also changes in our media and technology. So we have this explosion of social media and online environments. So much so that we really don't have to socially engage face to face much. We need to do it all online. How many of us are guilty? Like, can I just go to your text? Bing! This is sad. I'm not, I don't have to talk to you, but I can just throw you a text. So I'm limiting that connection, that interpersonal connection that really drives our empathy. So there's speculation that this lack of these personal connections is actually altering interpersonal dynamics. Have you seen changing your students over the years? I've seen that in nursing. There's a big shift of where even 10 years ago, I would not have seen these types of interpersonal dynamics that we're seeing right now in a healthcare profession. So I have to think about what's happening, what's that exposure. The rising reality TV really promotes these single winners, multiple users, very aggressive characteristics. We're going to take out the island. You're getting booted out of the house. You know, I'm going to win the million dollars. So rugged competition changes these perspectives and that we're thinking is happening in our, in our society. Certainly, our media and technology has been identified as desensitizing people to the pain of others. Okay, if I don't have to socially connect with you and talk with you, I don't really understand your pain. I'm doing everything online, I don't I can't read your nonverbal that you're giving me to understand your experiences. So it makes us think about the exposure to this the generation that we're now seeing. So is it important? I think it's kind of important. I mean my profession is very important. So if we can build empathy skills, it's actually shown that people have a deeper understanding of society. It leads to greater tolerance of our differences. And it enhances civic um, involvement. So volunteerism is highly associated with high empathy. So when Barack Obama was in um, office, there was a really big push to get out America and start volunteering. That understanding differences and connecting across the country was really prominent during that administration. 
And so I'm wondering if with that driving, although the data on college students would not indicate that, but is it driving some of you know, these empathy skills? And do we have a lack of it? Are we encouraging it? So I'm going to tell you a little bit about my personal journey with empathy and thinking about, well, how does this actually in, impact me and how I thought about course design? And I was teaching for the um, Madison Area Technical College at the time, and I was in their associate degree nursing program. My daughter, Amy, was in the undergraduate nursing program at UW Milwaukee. And she came home for a weekend, and she's so mad about her clinical instructor that she stopped listening to me, and I feel frustrated. And she yells at me when I don't get things right. And I'm watching her, and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, do I do that to my students? <laughs> if I, this is my daughter. <laughs> she's clearly having an emotional reaction. Have I done that? to my students. Now I'm the expert clinician and they're the novice and I'm not understanding that you don't get this. And it's coming so fast to me. Clearly you should understand that you should check that blood sugar. Clearly you should know that. Not, not so much. <laughs> not there yet. But my reaction was you should get it. You should get it. We'll fast to do this one in a clinical situation. I'm concerned. But I'm not reading that response. And I'm watching my daughter and it was a check moment to me. What am I doing? <laughs> to these students. So I changed my perspective and thought about where are they at as novice learners in the clinical realm and how can I help them grow in their learning rather than shutting them down and feeling like they don't deserve to be a nurse. So it changed what I did. So then my next moving experience is when I moved from being an expert clinician to a novice in research. So I have this very vivid memory of my first semester course in the PhD program in knowledge development and having a very knowledgeable professor take me to task and just pretty much disembowel me about my uh, my knowledge in philosophy. Oh, I'm a clinician. I can diagnose your heart failure. What do I know about this? Ontology. Don't even know what that term is. I didn't figure that out. But I remember thinking, oh, that felt awful. Awful, awful. And then I remember thinking, going back and thinking, do I do that to my students? Do I set them up to feel like you don't know anything because I'm expecting you, quick, 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 come on, regurgitate this for me. In the clinical realm, I'm the expert. In the research realm, not so much. So again, changed the focus I was taking with my students and my perspective because I started to understand what they might be experiencing in my classroom. My third very moment, a uh, pivotal moment in understanding empathy and how it shaped what I did as a teacher was finally getting a mismatch between the way I was shaping my course and delivering my content did not match my students' needs. And so um, at Cooper Hall, if you've ever been over there, the whole building is designed to be active learning. So we take students from the standing in a traditional lecture hall and they come into our building and we're like, yeah, no, that's all going to go away. It's all gone. We're going to teach you a whole new paradigm of learning. So we're not ready for the whole new paradigm of learning at the time that I flipped this classroom. And I flipped the classroom. I completely flipped it. And I couldn't understand, why are they so angry? <laughs> <laughs> you ready for this? You know, they already had a semester in this building. You are ready for this. Why are you so angry? With this. I'm doing all of this stuff to help you. Why are you so angry? And I get my evaluation and I go, oh, that's painful. <laughs> you know, I've never gotten an email this bad. Painful. Painful. And it's one of those things you get put it away. I can't look at this. It's like so painful. And so I let it sit there for a month and I thought about it and I thought, I still don't still don't understand why they're so mad. And I have, was um, was selected to be a teaching uh, math and teaching learning. MTLE, Madison Teaching Learning, an excellent fellow. And I was sitting in one of our classes and Chris started talking about intellectual development. I went, oh, oh, that's fine. <laughs> They're not there yet. <laughs> They're not there. They still need this connection with me to walk them through this clinical application. They still need to see me to talk about, you're struggling with this concept. Let's talk about this a little bit more. And that, that delivering all the content to them online did not meet where they were at in their intellectual development. I also realized after reflecting back on that experience is that I missed that personal connection with them. I couldn't read them 
Um, I didn't know. I just thought we had this huge, we couldn't connect. Huge disconnect. So I switched, completely switched. We had a hybrid model. We did, you got to do these readings. It's important for your, your own independent reading. But we're going to, those readings are going to supplement this 30 minute power lecture I'm going to give you. And that 30 minute power lecture with this reading is actually going to apply up. So we're going to all do it in one class session. And then we're going to do reflective posts on this. And you're going to it come respond to discussion posts and you'll work together on solving the problem. Big improvement <laughs> in how the class felt, the vibe of the class, but also how the students were responding on the evaluation. So that mismatch, I think we have to think about where are our students at in their intellectual development and are we designing these courses to actually fit where they're at. And that empathy helped because I felt, I remembered what it felt like to be burned. I remembered my daughter's response to what it was like to an instructor, and I was able to bring myself forward, thinking, "Oh, they don't really like this." So uh, something, something is wrong. Something is wrong with the universe. I need to do something different. So how do we do this? How do we come up with some different strategies for teaching empathy? And there's a lot of strategies that we can come up with. So role playing. You all love role playing. You students love role playing. We're tapping the affective component of empathy. It promotes this perspective taking, awareness of not only me, but somebody else. That's important. It focuses on imitation. It focuses on mimicking types of behaviors. Um, we can take that role of the other so we can generate insight to the feelings that an individual might be experiencing. And the other nice thing you can do with this is you can videotape them. And then you can say, now I want you to go back and I want you to evaluate your interpersonal interaction. So again, more self perspective, self-awareness, introspection, both. What, how did this go? Maybe what could I have done differently? Was I really showing empathy during that uh, encounter with an individual? Um, has anybody done psychodrama? They literally create plays and skits where you've got all of them within a situation. Sometimes we do this in simulation. It's a psychodrama where we have these high fidelity simulators and we have people coming in, the hysterical family members and other fan people arguing. We create these dramas in our clinical settings um, over at uh, Cooper Hall. So it hits all of those domains, that cognitive, the affective, that those behavioral components, we can watch actions, we can see what decision making the students are doing, and we can guide them. So sometimes we let the mannequin die, not always. <laughs> So we don't want to traumatize our students too much. But we get them through that stress and the anxiety of what does that feel like to be in a crisis situation. <laughs> With patients and lots of um, stuff going on in your environment. So it allows us to examine problems, it allows them all to examine problems. We can videotape those, in, those um, simulations and then they can go back and they can um, analyze what the interaction to look like. We always debrief our students after to bring them through what that experience is like. Mindfulness, cognitive component is really catching on a lot. We do talk about mindfulness a lot in healthcare, but mindfulness is everywhere. So we can use this with our students. It encourages us to become more aware and be present with our experiences. It encourages us to think, what is that physiologic response I'm having right now? And how do I calm that down so I can be more therapeutic? And it also is a place to be non-judgmental. And that's really important, helping our students and ourselves develop um, empathy, but it also helps us increase our emotional regulation. So I'm not going to just react. So when I got those nasty evaluations from students, it would be easy for me to be very angry and just react. And I did. <laughs> but it's just privately. Oh, I'm externally reacting to this. But it allowed me to just step back, be mindful, what are they experiencing, and then what can I do differently as a teacher? It's also been shown to help students increase empathy, but also prevent compassion fatigue in their health. So this is really important in nursing specifically and some of the different healthcare fields is when they're hit constantly with emotional experience after emotional experience, we have to be able to help them not burn out and not have compassion fatigue. So we use simulation a lot. I love simulation. It's so much fun with this. These are low fidelity simulations that we did. Um, this top picture is one of our students, and what we did is we put them in, we put them in goggles where we distort their vision, and we give them visions that we typically see happening in older adults. 
Um, and then we put arthritis gloves on them so they know what it's like to have arthritis, and we make them do things like open this pill bottle. Cut the meat with a fork. Use your knife when you can't see and you can't feel. And so we get, make them that this is this perspective taking, this awareness, um, your own self-awareness, but also awareness of others that they might be going through. Um, the middle picture was a um, we glow. We work with certified nursing assistants and personal care workers across Wisconsin. We talk about care of older patients. So one simple thing is we bring these little sensory kits, and it's a low fidelity simulation. So just looking through a plastic bag gives them the sensation of 20-80 vision. So we have them do things like read this recipe, look up a phone number, read the prescription model, so that they understand how difficult that is and maybe what do we need to do differently to help that individual. So you're not taking your medications the right way, well, there might be a reason why. I actually can't read what I'm saying. And then the third one, again, is using goggles, and we give them a bunch of, like, their um, jelly beans, which are different similar colors, and we say, oh, pick out the yellow one, pick out the orange one, pick out the green one. So let people understanding how people mess up medications all the time, and it's typically because they're just not seeing the colors, and that's how we're telling them to take it white colors, which is really the wrong way that we should be teaching medications and the medication. This one was a um, simulation done with our Kathy Junior's seniors. Juniors. So um, it's a poverty crisis simulation. And so um, the whole entire junior class goes through this, and I can't remember which course it's connected with. But um, they're thrown into this is your situation. You've lost housing, you have no food, where's your transportation, you don't have a job, I can access resources. So they go amongst different stations, they're given identities, they're given situations that throw them into, yeah, okay, this isn't gonna work, now what are you gonna do? There is small group work so they can best discuss amongst them other, their experiences with being in a situation of poverty, individual um, connection. So it's, um, um, it's a fairly um, well-run machine at this point. It uh, was dreamed up by a couple of our former um, clinical faculty and it's been very successful. So other strategies to think of, use of art. How many times have you seen a, a movie that just moves you? Okay, so I cannot watch Les Miserables unless I have a three-day prep period. Because <laughs> I know that I'm gonna be depressed <laughs> for several days after. I, it's the little kid losing the mom, I can't handle it, that house on the clouds thing just about makes me lose it every time, every time. And actually, I didn't start reacting to that until after I had children. So then I started, that, that hits me every single time. But I know that I'm going to have that effective response to that play. So I always have to prep myself for it's coming. But we can do lots of other things to use art and visual media to stimulate empathy in our students. And one of our colleagues now, Friday, does something with her students in our um, health program growth care class, and what she does is she signs them, they have to pick a book. And the book is about social justice in healthcare. And they have to really go through that book the entire semester, and they really think about those inequities. And how do people that are historically underrepresented access our healthcare system, and what is that like when they do access the healthcare system? So, and then they create these PowerPoints. It's wonderful what the students come up with from their perspective taking of what did they learn from that experience. We use blogs and we use journals. We also do some small group discussion with the students. So here's where I want your ideas. So we all have done this in some extent, um, some way that we've had empathy with our students. And these are only some ideas, and I know there is a wealth of ideas in this room. So what are you doing? Share. We all want to know. <laughs> we got to think about how to do this with our students. What, are, what kinds of things have you found to be successful? John's going to create a Google Doc. So. I've already Google Doc. Yeah. <laughs> and access it on the, the tiny URL, URL on your program. So if you had other things that you brought. I don't, do I need a microphone? You probably don't. Okay. <laughs> I'm pretty loud. I'll um, I don't know if this is exactly 
what you're looking for, but um, I do this thing, it's a class uh, about the ways we perform ideas of race, mm -hmm. and they start the semester, I guess I should back up, I just think listening is a really, really vital component, and a lot of my students are really great on output, you know, and they're not so good on, so we spend a lot of time talking about listening. Um, but at the beginning of the semester, I have them pick a word that has to do with something, some aspect of the ways that we're gonna study race. So diversity is an example. And then they have to go out and talk to people about what that word means in different contexts. They have to find how that word is used in popular culture, right? It's kind of a word study. It has an intellectual component, but what's great about it is they, they're forced to listen. And it starts the semester off by saying, that we don't all use language in the same way, right? That that word diversity can have multiple reactions in people. Um, so that you've got to listen, right? Which I think is kind of the first step. And that kind of frames the way that we think about the rest of the semester as we look at language and how it changes contextually, you know, based on who's speaking and the audiences. I love that. I think that can be easily applied in any course. What I have used is biomimicry. A uh, peacock feather is in a way that from different angle reflects the light in a, in a different ways, so you see many different colors. So we have created uh, a, a six-sided uh, cylinders, um, and then each side is uh, kind of painted different color. So then I ask the students to stay in one side and another one to stay in another side. So then I see what color they you see. They say, I see red. They say, no, you are seeing pink. You are seeing green. You are seeing red. They are yelling at each other because they don't see other persons from the view. So then I say, okay, now what you do is just a step, one step to the right, what color do you see? One step to the left to see what you see. So then they can see other person's point of view based on that one. By the way, I put that one on YouTube. I can send the link. Please do. <laughs> because that, that has uh, also, uh, I shared it with, uh, with our legislatures and other, because I see they don't get along. <laughs> <laughs> so that, you know, if you just one is to the right or left, you can see some other person's point of view. It doesn't mean that you are going to change, but at least you know where they are coming from. Mm -hmm. That is wonderful. That's what I use. That's great. And you can see how you can easily apply a lot of these things any of our courses, just different techniques. So I'm, I'm gonna get the get off the stage part. So, uh, <laughs> so I wanna thank you for your attention here and I'll leave you with this quote I love is that we remember that everyone who we meet is afraid of something, loves something, and has lost something in your life. Thank you.